When we land, we need to make sure we have enough runway to stop our aircraft safely. Otherwise, we might send our big heavy aircraft flying off the end of the runway into a field, into the sea, or maybe even into some buildings. But how do we figure out how much distance we need though? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the 11th class in the performance series. Today we're going to be taking a look at the landing phase of flight. This is going to be the final video covering all the different phases of flight before we move on to class A regulations, class B regulations and looking at some graphs in the CAP 698 document. But before we do that, we're going to have to learn how to land and more importantly stop an aircraft safely. The landing distance required for an aircraft starts from the screen height until the aircraft comes to a stop on the runway. This means that there is a section of landing distance which is actually in the air and also a ground run section. And the screen height that we're talking about is usually 50 feet for a class A and 35 for a class B aircraft. The screen is an imaginary wall that is placed on the runway threshold that the lowest part of the aircraft uh, must clear in order to land safely. And remember that thresholds can sometimes be displaced, so it's not necessarily the end of the runway. It could be, uh, say the displaced threshold was here, you'd have to cover this bit by 50 feet before landing. Calculations are done and tested by manufacturers and displayed in graphs are basically done according to passing this screen height at the correct altitude and at the correct speed. And say for instance, we were too high then we touch down at a later point on the runway and the brakes would only be able to be applied later and we therefore need more distance to land. So it's important that we cross the threshold at the screen height and at the correct speed. The speed that we aim for in landing is a speed called V-REF, basically the reference speed for landing. This is the speed that we cross the threshold at and the screen height at. And V-REF is calculated by comparing the minimum control speed for landing, which is VMCL, um, and the stall speed in the landing configuration, which is VS0, and we apply a safety factor to the stall speed so we don't actually reach a stall, which is 1.3. So it's this versus this, and VMCL, if you're not familiar, is basically a safe enough speed to fly at so that if we go around, there's enough flow over the aerodynamic surfaces to maintain control of the aircraft and the stall speed in the landing configuration is obviously going to keep us above the stall speed in the landing configuration. And we chuck on 1.3 as a safety factor just to make sure we're flying fast enough. So if we had an aircraft with a VSO of uh, 100 knots and a VMCL of 140 knots, then we multiply that by 1.3, we get 130 knots, and we use the higher of the two speeds. So our VREF in this occasion would be 140 knots. Simple as that. If we were to fly faster than this speed, then we'd have to slow down from a faster speed, increasing the total landing distance required. And if we flew any slower, we'd be at risk of stalling or being unable to control the aircraft in case of a go around. So it's important to fly as close to VREF as possible when passing over the threshold of the runway. After we have initially touched down, we can start to do things to slow us down. And the most effective thing to do is to use the brakes. Brakes convert the kinetic energy of the aircraft into heat energy in the brake pads themselves and in the wheels to slow down the plane down and therefore they can get quite hot. If it's a particularly hot day, you might come close to the high end of the safe range of temperatures to operate the brakes in and you might need to say you're turning the aircraft around you're landing somewhere and taking off soon after you might actually need to wait a bit for the brakes to cool down into a safe usable range again in order to get the most effective deceleration from the brakes we need to make sure that the whole weight of the plane is on the wheels as opposed to some of the weight being contracted by any residual lift that might be passing over the wings and being generated by air passing over the wings. This is done in large jets by using ground spoilers. Basically little flaps that pop up off the top of the wing. You've probably seen them when you've been landing looking out the window on a plane and they spoil ground spoilers or ruin the lift generation of the wings and that dumps the whole weight of the aircraft fully onto the wheels 
and it's especially important that we get the full weight of the aircraft onto the wheels quickly when the runway is wet, for example, or it's got ice or snow on it. And this is why you'll sometimes get quite heavy landings if the conditions are wet and horrible. It's because the brakes, sorry, the weight is on the wheels quicker and the brakes can be applied sooner under these slippery conditions. At least that's the excuse I use whenever I have a heavy landing. So there are a few things common on commercial transport aircraft that also help with braking. The first of these is anti-skid. Anti-skid applies the brakes on and off very, very quickly so that the wheel doesn't skid. The clue's in the name, it's anti-skid. This is because a brake only works whilst the wheel is spinning. We're trying to slow down the rotation with the brakes, not entirely stop it. That's because if the wheel completely stops rotating, then the tires will slide on the surface and we have no control over the speed. Whereas if they're continuously rotating, then we can slowly reduce the speed of the wheel rotation all the way down to a safe taxi speed. Anti-skid basically detects the first signs of tire skidding, releases the brakes, allowing the wheel to rotate again before applying the brakes again, doing this many, many times per second. And anti-skid is particularly useful in wet and contaminated conditions because the wet surface reduces the grip on the tarmac and makes the, to the tire more likely to skid in the first place. So if we have anti-skid, we're less likely to skid on a wet or icy runway. A second helpful tool on most airlines is an auto brake system. Again, the clue's in the name, it's an automatic braking system. And this system basically applies the brakes very shortly after touchdown, meaning that an element of crew reaction speed is taken out of the equation and the aircraft slows down regardless, meaning you will stop in the available distance. The second most important thing used to slow us down in a landing situation is reverse thrust. This basically works in a propeller by fining off the pitch of the propellers until we get a negative angle of attack at the propeller blades, ending up in a resultant force that is backwards instead of the normal forwards direction, and that is gonna slow us down, that is our reverse thrust. In a jet, we essentially redirect the flow of air. So instead of the air flowing through the engine this way, creating a resultant force forwards, we redirect some of that air. So it's now flowing in and back forwards, and that creates a resultant force, which is backwards. That is what we feel as reverse thrust. And this is something you can see online, and there's a few different ways to do it, but you sometimes see it as just little doors opening on the side of the engines, or sometimes it's like a whole uh, part of the engine cowl slides back and when you hear like really loud noises if you're near an airport, um, just after an aircraft's landed, it's usually this because the air is now hitting a surface rather than just like flowing through the engine, if that makes any sense. So reverse thrust alone probably won't be enough to stop an aircraft. So they must be used to assist with braking. Therefore, the total decelerating force is a combination of brakes and reverse thrust, and to some extent, aerodynamic drag from things such as the spoilers popping up and creating a bit of excess drag. So say for example, we used a lot of reverse thrust, then we wouldn't need as much braking force to make the total decelerating force that we require. And <clears throat> the reverse would be true as well. So different airlines will have different policies on what combinations are used as there's a bit of a trade-off. So if we used a lot of reverse thrust, then the brakes won't get used as hard and they won't get as hot so we would be able to turn the aircraft around quite quickly and we wouldn't get as much wear on the brakes in general. The contrast of this is that we're gonna be working the engine harder, meaning there's more wear on the engine and potentially higher maintenance cost. So it's basically, do you wanna spend more money maintaining the engine or do you wanna spend more money maintaining the brakes? And generally speaking, brakes are gonna be cheaper to replace. So we use more brakes and less reverse thrust and reverse thrust is also quite noisy so at night time, you might uh, use just very, very low levels of reverse thrust and high amounts of braking. So there's various things that will influence our landing distance requirements. So if we are heavier, then we need to fly faster in order to achieve the correct amount of lift. Our stall speed increases, in other words. So that means that our uh, speed for VREF is likely to be higher as well because we're taking the lower of the V, sorry, the higher of the stall speed times 1.3 or the VMCL uh, value. 
and that faster v ref speed results in a faster touchdown speed and there more therefore more distance is required in order to slow us down to a stop so as mass goes up the landing distance requirement also goes up so altitude and temperature are both sort of similar because they increase the sorry as they increase the density of the air decreases and one way to think of it is using the equation for lift again so say we have a lower density we need to fly faster same story as over here we're going to be flying a faster stall speed faster uh, vmcl speed taking a higher v ref speed landing faster more time to slow down and the other way to think about it is basically that if it's less dense air it's a faster true air speed for the same indicated air speed and i would default to using these three fingers again and say we're increasing in altitude our landing v reference speed is 140 knots from before but if we're increasing altitude that means our true air speed's actually going to increase a bit as well so if we're higher up, we're going to be landing at a faster, truer speed, which means touching down at a faster speed, taking more distance to slow down, and temperature, you know that temperature uh, decreases as altitude increases, etc. So if we have a strong headwind on landing, then we don't need as much distance to stop. This is because our ground speed will be a lot slower. Say our VREF, for example, was 140 knots, and we have a 20 knot headwind, then that means that our indicated airspeed of 140 knots is a ground speed of 120 knots plus the 20 knot headwind that we're feeling over the wing and providing the lift and the speed indications that we're reading. This means that on landing, instead of slowing down from 140 knots, we're actually only slowing down from a ground speed of 120 knots. This means less distance required to slow down to a safe speed. Tailwind would be the opposite case. And as wind is variable and unreliable, we only use 50% of the headwind and uh, we use 150% of the tailwind components so that we're not overly reliant on this inconsistent wind. So braking depends on the wheels gripping the runway surface. If they have nothing to grip onto, then they might slide and the brakes don't work if the wheels are not rotating. So the best conditions for grip are when it's dry and when the run made is made out of nice friction filled tarmac. If anything deviates from this, then the brakes or more specifically the tires won't be able to grip and slow down the plane as quickly and as fast. If the runway is wet, for example, the normal factor to apply to your calculated landing distance is 1.15. So say we had a landing distance required when dry of a thousand meters, then our wet landing distance required would be 1,150 meters. Simple. And if that was going to make us go off the end of run the runway or something, we might need to use more reverse thrust or a higher level of auto braking or indeed land somewhere else. So the slope of the runway is also important. So if we land into an upsloping runway, then some of the weight of the aircraft pulls us down the slope and helps with slowing down the aircraft. And if we were to land down the slope, then the weight of the aircraft would pull us down the slope and make it harder for us to stop. The effect is usually quite small though because runways are pretty flat, generally speaking, and it's not like we're gonna be landing into a 45 degree slope like this, so the effect is pretty minor. So because humans fly planes, it means we don't always cross the screen height at exactly 50 feet at VREF and don't always apply the brakes or select reverse thrust at the ideal time. We might also make slight variations to the landing and flare technique in general, which means that two identical aircraft on the same day flown by different people might have vastly different landing distances. We therefore apply a safety factor to cover for these variations. We essentially don't want to use all of the runway. We want to have some left over to account for these changes. For a jet, for example, we want to land in the first 60% of the runway and for a propeller, it's 70%. This means that when we calculate our landing distance required for a jet, we need to multiply it by 1.67, and that needs to be less than or equal to the total landing distance available. And for a propeller, it's the landing distance required multiplied by 
and that needs to be less than or equal to the landing distance available. Or alternatively, you can take the total landing distance available and multiply that by uh, 70% or 60% um, over here. And that has to be, that's your new factorized landing distance available and your landing distance required would not be allowed to be over that distance.